Martin Scorsese has directed some of the most beloved movies of the last 50 years, with titles like Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, Raging Bull, and The Departed being cemented as modern classics. Scorsese's style is both versatile and immediately recognizable. While he may be most popular for directing mob movies, he has been known to stray from the beaten path with movies like Silence or Hugo. The stylistic mannerisms most commonly attributed to Scorsese are the rock soundtracks, his kinetic camera work, complicated anti-heroes, and deconstruction of the American dream. His long-term partnerships with certain actors like Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio are pretty famous, and with crew members like editor Thelma Schoonmaker and cinematographers Michael Ballhouse, Robert Richardson, Michael Chapman, and Rodrigo Prito, we have a pretty good understanding of his visual style. With 24 narrative feature films on his resume, Scorsese has forever changed the landscape of American cinema, and he's done it over and over and over again for nearly six decades. While many of the great directors frequently studied by film theorists produce or have produced difficult or non-commercial work, most of Scorsese's filmography has been made as part of the Hollywood studio system. His work is, for the most part, decidedly commercial for audiences. That being said, Scorsese rarely shies away from sometimes subversive material that you're not used to seeing in expensive blockbusters. For this video, we will be looking at every feature-length narrative film of Martin Scorsese's long and brilliant career, and I will be ranking them from worst to best. I have spent the last several weeks re-watching Scorsese's films, and it took me a long time to compile a list I was comfortable sharing. If you're going to rank the films of a director like Martin Scorsese, you do have to make some rules. The first rule is, there has to be a last place, but last place doesn't necessarily mean the movie is bad. Last place just means it's my least favorite Martin Scorsese film. While I call a film Scorsese's worst, what I really mean is that it could be any other filmmaker's potential best. I at least enjoy every single movie on this list, but if I'm going to rank them, they have to be ranked. The second rule is, what counts as a film? Well, for this list, only narrative fiction feature films with their direction exclusively credited to Martin Scorsese count. While his documentary work is frequently fascinating and even sometimes fantastic, it would be difficult to compare the documentaries to his narrative feature work. Anthology films like New York, New York also don't count, as multiple directors are credited. Scorsese has also directed for television, but those episodes will not be considered for this list. Third rule. The ranking is determined by three factors. Story, craft, and performance. It's the job of a director to tell a story, to expertly display their craft, and to inspire appropriate performances for the material. Each film discussed will be assessed on all three categories. Some films may excel in craft, but lack in story or performance, for example, and those factors may affect their ranking. For this video, I will be talking about each film in terms of story, craft, and performance, and each category will be given a ranking out of five. When those categories are averaged together, that final number will determine the ranking of the film. Okay, now that we've established the rules, let's get started. Number 24, Boxcar Bertha. As far as Roger Corman productions go, Boxcar Bertha at least has a little life to it. The Roger Corman pipeline certainly delivered enormous talent to Hollywood and allowed young filmmakers to experiment with their craft, but these were cheap movies with exploitative plots. Even though Corman introduced us to Jack Nicholson or the Carradines or Francis Ford Coppola and a whole host of some of the greatest filmmakers of the last half century, the movies themselves typically boil down to shoddily written crime and horror films meant to be played as literal B-pictures in drive-in movies. 
Obviously, if Martin Scorsese is directing the film, it's going to at least be worth watching, but Boxcar Bertha is a bit of an anomaly in the career of Scorsese. Unlike his early short films or his first feature, Who's That Knocking on My Door?, Boxcar Bertha doesn't possess many of the themes or interests Scorsese would later become known for. It is simply a director for hire job. It's a curiosity, but not really good. In terms of the craft, the filmmaking itself is pretty fun, but there's nothing here that Scorsese doesn't do much better in basically all of his other movies. While I do enjoy Barbara Hershey in a lot of films, it's really not a very good performance here, and every performance seems to kind of know what movie it's in, but the movie itself just isn't very good. Number 23. Who's That Knocking at My Door? Scorsese's first feature-length film amounts to little by the end of it, but it's a great introduction to many of the themes and visual hallmarks Scorsese would tackle much more ambitiously in later films like Mean Streets and Taxi Driver. Who's That Knocking at My Door is a New York picture starring Harvey Keitel. The film was shot over a period of two years, and the plot follows Keitel's character J.R., an Italian Catholic who allows his naivete and ignorance govern his decisions with his new girlfriend. The camera work throughout, especially one extended take in a bus station or train station maybe, Mark Scorsese is an early talent, but the low budget of the movie and its overall message haven't allowed the film to age quite as gracefully as Scorsese's later films. The black and white photography is fantastic, and some of the shots are ambitious for a movie of this scale and budget, but the sound design never really comes together, and that kind of hurts the entire film. While Keitel's performance has some truth to it, the rest of the cast doesn't really deliver much. Number 22. The Color of Money I'm going to be honest, The Color of Money is one I have trouble reviewing at all. It's a sequel to a better film from Newman's golden period as a Hollywood star, and Paul Newman is a lot of fun reprising his role as Fast Eddie. It's also great to see Tom Cruise in a Scorsese movie, and the direction is light and sometimes exhilarating. I'm just not a huge fan of Pool nor do I know that much about it, but the story still works anyway because of the performances from Cruz and Newman. When I recently watched this again, I, I thought about how Cruz would play a great Fast Eddie kind of character if there was ever going to be a third movie in this series. Scorsese's direction is fast and elegant, and he leans into his kinetic camera work to make the pool hall scenes really shine. Michael Ballhaus, Rainer Werner Fassbender's frequent cinematographer, uses color and light here to add a certain greaseball shine to everything. Newman is at his charismatic best, and Cruz is excellent as a young hothead, but the rest of the cast is just fine. Paul Newman's Best Actor Oscar for this film in particular is kind of baffling to me, but maybe it's because Newman was so consistently good throughout his entire career that it's sometimes hard to tell when he's standing out. It's actually shocking that Cruz didn't even get a nomination for an Oscar for this performance because I, I genuinely think he's actually better than Newman in this. Number 21, Cape Fear. Cape Fear is not a sequel, but a remake of J. Lee Thompson's 1962 film of the same name. Replacing Robert Mitchum is Robert De Niro, Scorsese's frequent collaborator. The film is a psychological thriller following Max Cady, a psychotic and singularly focused multiple felon who is determined to ruin the life of his defense lawyer who botched his trial. The film is tense, if somewhat silly, and it's a thriller much in the vein of later Hitchcock films like Marnie. While the story is compelling all the way through, it's tough to take any of it seriously because of the gonzo nature of the storytelling. However, if that's the kind of movie you're in the mood for, this one certainly scratches that itch. More important than the story is the craft of Cape Fear. Scorsese goes full maximalist here. He uses crash zooms, 
Dutch angles, whip pans, crane shots, split diopter, and any other number of attention-grabbing stylistic choices to show off his virtuoso skills. Not only is Scorsese working in stylistic pastiche here, but he seems to be over-directing, even compared to contemporaries like Brian De Palma. It's a lot of fun to just watch this movie as an experiment in craft. In fact, it's the overuse of craft that leads the film maybe to its downfall. The directing is just much more interesting and fun than the story that's being told. So in that way, the story and the craft are kind of let down by each other. This movie just doesn't work as well for me as it does for some, but you can't deny the sheer amount of effort De Niro is putting into this performance. This is an enormously committed performance, with De Niro even getting semi-permanent tattoos and dental work done for the part of Max Cady. It's a demented choice from today's perspective to cast Nick Nolte as a normal person, but his performance is only just outside of the realm of cartoon, making it only slightly less silly than whatever accent he's trying to do in Lorenzo's oil. Number 20. Mean Streets. I like to think of Mean Streets as an expansion of the themes and interests showcased in Scorsese's debut, Who's That Knocking at My Door? While his debut film was limited in execution and budget, Mean Streets opens up the story to include the story not just of Keitel's character, named Charlie instead of JR here, but to also Charlie's friends. Mean Streets is also the first film from Scorsese in which the mob plays an integral part of the plot, and Scorsese's own childhood and young adult experiences are on display. The storytelling here is loose and episodic, and the film never really seems to deliver on the promises of those exciting opening minutes. The pacing and the plot elements are fairly obvious, and maybe that's due to Scorsese's later better movies about the mob, but Mean Streets definitely suffers from being so early in the development of Scorsese's storytelling journey. The camera work and soundtrack choices here act as incredible foreshadowing to what he'd be doing in the next movies he'd be making. But it's really all here, from the long single-take scenes, to the use of French New Wave editing, to the use of contemporary rock in the soundtrack. This is the first film of Scorsese's career in which it is unmistakably a Scorsese picture. Keitel is great as Charlie, but the real standout is Robert De Niro, working with Scorsese for the first time and absolutely crushing it. His portrayal of Johnny Boy was reportedly a huge inspiration for the portrayal of Joaquin Phoenix's character in The Master, and apparently De Niro was so committed to the role that crew members weren't sure if De Niro was actually just kind of insane. Number 19, Cundin. I respect Cundin for existing at all. Scorsese sought out this material and nearly tanked his career for doing it. Hot off the successes of Goodfellas, Cape Fear, The Age of Innocence, and Casino, Scorsese directed Cundin for Disney's Touchstone Pictures, a film about the 14th Dalai Lama and Tibet's oppression from the Chinese government. The film is a fairly straightforward biopic and it's a little obvious in a lot of places, but the characters' journeys do work. However, it seems like maybe Melissa Matheson, the screenwriter of E.T., and Martin Scorsese, a quintessentially American director, are not really the right people to be telling this story. It never feels truly specific or lived in enough to really feel like anything other than a story about a place. It also just consistently strange that everybody in this movie speaks with an accented English instead of their native language. What Cundin lacks in its storytelling, it more than makes up for with its craft. The photography from the legendary cinematographer Roger Deakins is truly stunning, and much of the film being lit by candle and natural landscapes gives it a really great lived-in feel. The costumes, the art direction, and the editing are all involving, but it's that Philip Glass score which has lived beyond the movie. It's a dazzling score, and it's rightfully upheld as one of the great scores of the 1990s. However, despite all of this great craft behind the film, the story itself is really just let down by the screenplay. The performances in this film are largely delivered by non-professional actors, and while they aren't necessarily distracting, they're also not very remarkable either.
number 18, The Aviator. I may not be the audience for pool hall drama, but I am absolutely the audience for movies about people with undying obsessions and a little bit of social anxiety. The Aviator is a biopic about the famous oil tycoon, aviation engineer, and film director Howard Hughes, played here by Leonardo DiCaprio. The film focuses on the early adulthood of Hughes when he began making a name for himself as an eccentric genius. The film does an excellent job of capturing the time period and what made Hughes particularly magnetic to Americans in the post-war era. The most compelling moments of the film center on Hughes making his film Hell's Angels, as it seems to also be the bits that Scorsese is most interested in as a fellow director. The movie also chronicles Hughes's relationship with Katherine Hepburn, played here by Kate Blanchett's pretty remarkable embodiment of her. The movie may be a bit overlong, and some of the episodic nature of the plot can be felt in that second act, but the pacing is largely fast and absorbing. The film is full of Scorsese's classic camera movement, especially in terms of crane shots. The audience is just constantly flung around the set, and the surreal approach to lighting and flashbacks elevates the material. But Scorsese never really breaks out of his normal operating procedure, or uses his craft in particularly impressive or experimental ways compared to the films surrounding this one. DiCaprio's performance is certainly committed, but he's constantly overshadowed by the supporting players here, especially Blanchett, who really does give just a great celebrity impersonation of Katharine Hepburn. Another standout is Alan Alda, who really takes the movie and kind of runs with it in that final act. I love him in this. Number 17, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Scorsese's first foray into making something outside of his comfort zone. Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore is about a woman, Alice, played here by Ellen Burstyn in an Oscar-winning performance, trying to recreate her life after the death of her husband. In under two hours, Scorsese is able to craft a gentle and moving portrait of a woman remaking herself in middle age. This is also the film where Scorsese would meet a young Jodie Foster, who will appear again much later in this list. After directing Mean Streets, Scorsese shoots Arizona like it's another planet, and it's great to see the director try his hand at a gentle drama set outside of New York. This film really benefits from its road trip structure, and the interpersonal relationships between Alice and her co-workers feel totally real. Chris Christopherson appears in this film as David, and he and Alice develop a romance. Unfortunately for me, once the romance starts, the movie kind of loses my interest. I much prefer the parts of the movie where Alice attempts to establish herself as a lounge singer or a waitress in a new town, and the romance feels a bit forced for a film that seems to establish its thesis as a movie about a woman who is freed from the confines of marriage. The cinematography here by Kent Wakeford, who also shot Mean Streets, is perfectly adequate for this film, but under the hand of some of Scorsese's later collaborators, you can really see how the vistas of Arizona could be put to better use. The film is more of a showcase of Burstyn's performance than many of the tricks Scorsese used in Mean Streets just a year earlier. As I said before, Burstyn is just a star in this. She is absolutely fantastic as Alice, where she is both strong and delicate as a woman struggling in the intermission of her life. Diane Ladd is also great as Flo, whose character is really so great that it feels like the true inspiration for the eventual television remake of this movie. Other actors are in and out, most notably Harvey Keitel, who shows up for one particularly upsetting scene. Unfortunately, I'm just not into Chris Christopherson's performance in this movie. He lacks the commitment of Burstyn, and it's actually kind of a bit awkward to see the disparity of their performances. Number 16. The Departed. Hey, before you get upset about how low The Departed is on this list, understand that its placement is more of a testimony to the filmography of Scorsese than it is to discredit this movie. The Departed was the first Scorsese film I ever saw in a movie theater, and I saw it with my dad. I remember that experience being really special, and we both loved the movie, but 
In the years since its release, some of that sparkle has just kind of dimmed for me for whatever reason. Maybe it's because I've seen the Infernal Affairs trilogy, the films which inspired this one, or maybe it's just because I've now seen all the Scorsese films which followed this one. I would consider The Departed a fulcrum point in Scorsese's career, where he's no longer interested in making films that quite make sense for him, and he starts messing around with the formulas a little bit. In that way, The Departed feels like both a fond farewell to the mob movies he's most famous for, and a welcome home to the more haunted later period of his work. Look, I know The Irishman will be released 10 years later, and that's definitely a mob movie, but we're, we're going to get to that. The Departed just has so much to like in terms of story, and the dialogue is compelling and fast and smart and endlessly entertaining. The crossing and double crossing never really gets confusing, and the pacing stays utterly compelling. Jack Nicholson's Frank Costello is an unpredictable villain, if a bit difficult to understand in any kind of realistic context, and DiCaprio and Damon's Costigan and Sullivan remain interesting, nuanced characters who have to signal switch constantly as their paranoia rises. The film's famous final act is still surprising after all these years. It just takes some giant swings, and most of those swings really land. It's a fun movie that never really takes itself too seriously, but instead consistently entertains. The soundtrack, and especially the camera work by Michael Ballhaus, are just undeniable. The prologue of this film, which spans around 20 minutes, is some of the most kinetic and exciting filmmaking of Scorsese's career, giving the audience what feels like a career-capping blowout of all the things he's been perfecting about this film since Who's That Knocking at My Door? Obviously, there's no way the movie could keep up with that particular pace, and the middle act kind of finds its own groove, and I do love this movie, and I think Scorsese's work here is great, but it's, it's difficult for me to find anything else in this film as captivating as those earlier minutes. I do typically think of this movie as Jack Nicholson's real final performance. I know he was in the bucket list and how do you know after this, but The Departed is the last time Nicholson really brought the heat for me. He obviously relishes in the opportunity to play the most cartoonishly evil person you've ever seen in a movie. and. Some of his choices that he makes throughout this movie are bizarre and kind of exciting, but the movie just blows everyone else out. DiCaprio's Costigan is an interesting character, but because the plot is so breakneck, especially for him, there's really not a lot of room for that character to flesh itself out as anything other than someone to follow. The same is true for Damon Sullivan, who does get a bit more to do, but he still never really makes an emotional impact. Of course, Wahlberg's Oscar-nominated performance as Dignan is essentially amounting to a wonderful late-night comedy set, but every minute he's on screen, you are kind of electrified by it. It's also always great to see Vera Farmiga, but she's really not given that much to do here, and other performances like Martin Sheen aren't particularly interesting, but I do like Martin Sheen, so that's fun. Number 15. Hugo. Hugo is the only Scorsese film you could confidently call a children's film, but it's a strange one to actually recommend to children. Instead, this feels like a movie made for Martin Scorsese in particular. It's essentially a morality tale about the importance of film preservation, a topic Scorsese himself has devoted much of his life to. Hugo follows the story of a young boy who lives in a Paris railway station. Over the course of the film, Hugo attempts to repair an automaton he and his father found, and that process allows for him to meet the locals around the train station and eventually a toy store owner, Georges, played by Ben Kingsley. The film is kind of longer than you would expect it to be, and the final act would likely make a lot of younger audiences tune out, but the film's message about aging artists and the preservation of art is profound. I'm just going to say it, this is the best 3D movie I've ever seen in a movie theater. Scorsese uses 3D cameras here to make the train station come alive, and every shot feels like another opportunity to use the effect in a new and exciting way. Hugo was released right in the center of the 3D movie craze following Avatar, and it's this film that really capitalizes on the technology after James Cameron proved its viability. Robert Richardson's photography is fantastic throughout and the colors and costuming make this one of the more handsome movies of Scorsese's entire filmography. 
Unfortunately, watching this film again without the 3D effect kind of makes you just sad that you're not watching it in 3D. Ben Kingsley gives another one of his reliable, mysterious, old dude performances, and Aza Butterfield and Chloe Moretz also give solid child performances. Jude Law's extended cameo is full of pathos and wonder, and Sasha Baron Cohen does whatever he's doing, but none of the performances really ever register above the material. Number 14, After Hours. After the king of comedy bombed at the box office, Scorsese went searching for material that would allow him to branch out. He found that material in Joseph Minion's script for After Hours. Scorsese's only out-and-out -out comedy is a dark one, and it's pretty Kafka-esque. It's a one wild night plot, and it's one of the most fun examples of that genre. The film stars Griffin Dunn as Paul Hackett, a boring office worker who is lured into the offbeat and dangerous world of New York City's Soho neighborhood. When Paul meets Rosanna Arquette's Marcy, he agrees to meet her at her apartment later that night, but after a series of mishaps, miscommunications, and a surprise death, Paul's night devolves into a nightmare which grows increasingly surreal as the night goes on. The film is hilarious and dark and strange and kind of singular within the filmography of Martin Scorsese. It would actually be really great to see him tackle material like this again sometime. The film is deceptively fantastic in the craft department. Nearly every shot in this movie is a night shot, and Scorsese uses what he learned from shooting Taxi Driver to make the New York City nightlife really shine in this film. After Hours is also the first collaboration between Scorsese and Michael Ballhaus, who would become a frequent collaborator for Scorsese in the decades to come. The visual language of After Hours is all about zooms, dollies, cranes, close-ups. The movie just feels alive, and it has the visual language of something like a Looney Tune, which perfectly fits the story of this film. Griffin Dunn is fantastic as Paul with the correct amount of irritation and confusion and fear running through his entire performance. Other actors like Catherine O'Hara and John Hurd from Home Alone really stand out in the supporting cast, but the nature of the movie never really allows anybody else to shine. Number 13, Casino. This one's interesting because if I'm going to be honest, I don't really care about any of the people in this movie or really any of the things they're doing. I'm not interested in casinos or the history of Las Vegas or the history of Las Vegas casinos. I don't really care about this form of the mob. Ace, Robert De Niro's character, is a person I don't really care about at all on paper or in the film. And if I just read the script, I don't think I'd even finish it. And yet... Boy, is this movie well made. This movie, it feels like an exercise for Scorsese, operating at the absolute peak of his craft and pulling together all of his skills. For a movie about people I don't care about, man, do I keep my eyes glued to the screen for the entirety of this three-hour movie. Every choice is interesting. Every single one. Even throwaway shots that last a few seconds have these complicated crane setups I can't even wrap my head around. The music never stops. The Robert Richardson photography is clean and colorful and perfect. There are shots in this movie that absolutely blow me away for the amount of work they must have taken to execute, just the sheer effort. Scorsese's mid-period penchant for making an entire movie feel like the first five minutes of any other movie just never really feels better than this one. Between the movement of the camera, the constant voiceover, the music, and the speed at which the story moves... You feel like you just never leave that opening montage. It's actually exhilarating. Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Sharon Stone are brilliant in this movie. De Niro plays an unknowable, basically mythological presence throughout this movie, and Pesci plays Nicky like he's a dragon in some sort of medieval fantasy. Pesci takes the pathologies he displayed in Goodfellas and dials them up even more here to craft really just one of the most terrifying people I've ever seen in a movie. Sharon Stone is at her career best as Ginger, a tragic figure who really just gives the movie some grounded emotional centering. Number 12, Raging Bull. 
I know, Raging Bull is pretty low on this list. I get it. But I just don't really love the act of watching it. I understand what makes this one good, but I, I have to be brutally honest here. I, I hate Jake LaMotta, and not in a fun or compelling way. I don't really care. He is an awful brother and even worse husband and really just a difficult character to hang out with for any amount of time. I have a hard time with the pacing of this movie. There's long scenes of LaMotta just being awful to people who are nice and who love him. And the third act, which just pulls you through the mud. I'm just not into this movie's story, and yet I've also probably seen it like a dozen times. That's because the craft of this thing is just undeniable. Michael Chapman's cinematography is rightly held up as some of the best to ever come out of American cinema. Every single bit of this is just gorgeous to look at. The hazy black and white, the deep blacks, the sweeping movements and the boxing matches, every element of the visuals is perfect. The Dolby Stereo sound design places you in each match and allows you to enter the world of Jake LaMotta, for better or worse. Thelma Schoonmaker's editing here is some of the best I've ever seen in any movie. The film is just immaculately made at every single level. De Niro's performance is basically the stuff of legend at this point. He trained so hard at boxing that he apparently could have just become an actual contender for the championship. He gained 60 pounds for the last 20 minutes of the movie. He actually broke Joe Pesci's nose in an argument scene. I mean, it's a fearless and peerless portrayal of a broken man. The only problem is that besides maybe Pesci, nobody else is operating anywhere close to the level De Niro is, and you can kind of tell. Number 11, The Wolf of Wall Street. Just outside of the top 10, let's just take a look at this misunderstood movie. In Scorsese's efforts to make Jordan Belfort's story a cautionary tale, I think he kind of accidentally signaled the finance bros everywhere that Belfort is some kind of heroic genius. It's really by no fault of Scorsese, whose film goes to great pains to make Belfort an idiot buffoon, but the breezy storytelling and nuclear performance from DiCaprio in this best performance of his career, I'm just going to say it, are almost too entertaining for their own good. How often do you watch a three-hour movie that feels this short, where each scene feels this important? The humor works, the drama works, the fourth wall breaking adds depth and really a lot of complexity to the character of Jordan Belfort, and the final act is just this crushing consequence for the excesses of the first two. It's a brilliantly written screenplay by Terrence Winter, and the film's feeling of effortless glee is just contagious to the viewer. Kind of hard to believe this film was released in the fifth decade of a director's career, as the direction does just feel experimental and youthful, and the way it's presented is not that dissimilar from Mean Streets that was released 40 years before this. In terms of craft, Scorsese is just at the top of his game. Every shot is kinetic, the soundtrack is unstoppable, the cinematography from Rodrigo Brito is stunning. They really just make every single shot interesting, a lot like Casino, and the film never really feels cloying or frustrating as a result. There is no restraint here, and it matches the story perfectly. It is directed to excess, the same way Jordan Belfort lived his life. If you were ever to show somebody how Scorsese's work differs from a lot of contemporary filmmakers, I mean, I, you really just gotta show them Wolf of Wall Street. DiCaprio flexes his movie star muscles better here than he has ever before, or really since. He is just utterly electric in this film, and you can immediately understand why anybody would follow him into hell. He is hilarious and awful and arrogant and despicable and pathetic all the way through, yet you just can't take your eyes off him. And it's his performance alone that may have inspired a generation of crypto bros to buy suits and slick their hair back. Other standouts are Jonah Hill, Matthew McConaughey, and Margot Robbie, all just giving fantastic performances which serve the movie well. However, shockingly, there are still 10 Scorsese movies which I think work better than this one. Number 10, Bringing Out the Dead. Nicolas Cage and Patricia Arquette star in this underseen masterpiece from Scorsese who directed this in between the financial failure of Cundin and the mixed critical response to gangs in New York. 
Bringing Out the Dead follows the story of Frank Pierce, an ambulance driver in New York City who is haunted by the ghosts of the people who died in his efforts to save them. The movie follows Frank through three different nights with three very different ambulance drivers, one played by John Goodman, one by Ving Rhames, and one by Tom Sizemore. The movie is surreal and dreamlike, and Paul Schrader's screenplay is darkly funny and also scary. In some ways, the film feels like a combination of After Hours and Taxi Driver, and sometimes the tone is a bit wonky, but I really love this movie, and I want more people to try to get a hold of it. Bringing Out the Dead was the final film to be released on Laserdisc, and it's also looking like it may end up being the final film released on Blu-ray, as that forever rumored Criterion edition, as of this recording, is just that. Merely a rumor. Speaking of high definition, this may be up there with Scorsese's best looking movies. Robert Richardson's night photography is absolutely stunning. The colors pop, especially the reds. And the soundtrack is my absolute favorite of all of Scorsese's movies. Elmer Bernstein's music is exceptional, and the nightmarish visions Frank has throughout the movie are appropriately surreal and scary. Look, think what you want about Nicolas Cage, but I think he's great here as Frank, the most tired man you've ever seen in any movie. And Ving Rhames is particularly hilarious, but it's John Goodman who stands out here in a performance of warmth and charm and real stakes. I would love to see John Goodman reprise this role in something else. Number nine, Silence. Scorsese's lifelong struggle to get Silence made a film based on the novel by Shusako Endo, finally came to fruition in 2016. The film marks the final entry in Scorsese's Faith Trilogy, which includes Kunden and The Last Temptation of Christ. Silence is set in 17th century Japan, and it follows Andrew Garfield's father Rodriguez's quest to find his mentor, Liam Neeson's father Ferreira, who was captured by Japanese soldiers. The movie is over two and a half hours of characters suffering unimaginable traumas for their faith. The story is told with proper respect given to both the Catholic missionaries and the Japanese men who fought against the imperialism of Western culture. It's clear from the very beginning how committed Scorsese is in his storytelling, and it contains some of the most restrained filmmaking of his career. The final act of the film asks the audience to grapple with their preconceived notions about these characters and their efforts. It is really a truly beautiful and heartbreaking film. Rodrigo Brito's cinematography is tight and controlled, in stark contrast to his work in The Wolf of Wall Street. Every image feels anguished over, and the muted greens and blues of the image make for a beautiful and serene experience. However, it is Thelma Schoonmaker's editing here that gives the film its edge. Through just cuts and silences, Schoonmaker is able to lead the audience to understand all of the subtext in each scene, and her craft is really just never better than it's been here. Adam Driver stands out with his gaunt portrayal of Father Groupe and Liam Neeson's late arrival to the film as some of the best work he's done in 15 years, but Garfield's performance really just owns this movie. It is a sensitive, quiet portrayal of a man whose faith means everything to him. And you can really feel that in this movie. Number eight, The Age of Innocence. After the one-two punch of Goodfellas and Cape Fear, Scorsese switched tones dramatically with The Age of Innocence, a period drama based on Edith Wharton's famous novel of the same name. This film marks the first collaboration between Scorsese and Daniel Day-Lewis, who plays Newland Archer, a lawyer planning to marry Winona Ryder's Mae Welland. But he is quickly allured by the much more prickly and interesting Ellen Alinska, played here by Michelle Pfeiffer. The film is a gorgeous and tense deconstruction of the high society of New York in the 19th century, and it would make for an interesting companion piece to a later collaboration between Scorsese and Day-Lewis. The Age of Innocence is a character study of the ways in which society restricts us of living the life we truly want, and the film's final moments are some of the most moving of Scorsese's career as a storyteller. I know I'm repeating myself when I say this, but the collaboration between Scorsese and Michael Ballhouse is just unbelievable. 
The Age of Innocence is an absolutely gorgeous movie from top to bottom. The camera dances with the characters in each scene, and the blocking of each sequence is a masterclass in how simple character and camera movement can tell a story all on its own. Elmer Bernstein's score, Gabriella Pestrucci's Oscar-winning costumes, and Ferretti and Franco's art direction all work to make this one of the most luscious and sensuous movies of Scorsese's filmography. Daniel Day-Lewis is highly regarded for a reason. He is gentle and insular and compelling at every turn as Archer, and Pfeiffer is immediately the standout in her turn as Ellen, where she is equal parts frustrating and lovable in this stuffy high society echo chamber from which she's trying to escape. Number seven, The King of Comedy. The King of Comedy has been reevaluated in the decade since it bombed at the box office and mostly baffled critics. The further we get into the parasocial relationships of social media, the better people are able to understand this terrifying portrayal of a deeply sad and insecure and isolated person. The film was an obvious inspiration for the 2019 film Joker, and that's been much written about, but that film lacks the social and emotional context the King of Comedy delivers. De Niro's portrayal of the failed stand-up comedian Rupert Pupkin trying to achieve his American dream of being loved and admired by the people around him is so deeply tragic and sad. Unlike Taxi Driver's Travis Bickle, whose similar antisocial behavior inspires him to commit crimes with the hope of making a positive difference in his neighborhood, Rupert Pupkin only wants to achieve clarity through fame, but his delusions keep getting in the way. The film is uncomfortable and awkward, and the humor is constantly undercut by the feeling of dread you feel for each decision Rupert makes. It is a brilliant and sad and terrifying film about the nature of celebrity and the anonymity of isolation. The King of Comedy is much more subtle and nuanced in its filmmaking than many of Scorsese's flashier and earlier films. Thelma Schoonmaker's editing is again the standout here, but Fred Schuller's cinematography occasionally shines in the smallness of Pupkin's portrayal. De Niro is absolutely sensational as the quiet and sad Rupert Pupkin. It is such a different performance from anything else he's done in his career, and it's interesting to watch somebody as charismatic and lovable as De Niro can usually be utterly fail to have really any redeemable qualities. Other standouts are Jerry Lewis as a late-night comedy host who seems to hate show business, and Sandra Bernard as another delusional loner trying to break out of her lonely existence. Number 6. Shutter Island I'm a sucker for film noir, I'm a sucker for horror, and I'm definitely a sucker for psychological thrillers. What we have here is all three. Shutter Island is based on Dennis Lehaney's novel of the same name, and it follows two detectives, Leonardo DiCaprio's U.S. Marshal Teddy Daniels and Mark Ruffalo's U.S. Marshal Chuck, their investigation into the disappearance of Rachel Solando in the remote island campus of Ashcliff Hospital for the Criminally Insane. The story is pulpy and twisty, and Scorsese clearly relishes the opportunity to make a horror thriller by making each scene a powerful showcase for his ability to create tension and establish perspective. Sure, the final act twist can be spotted a mile away, and it's something you've seen before, but this film actually works better on repeat viewings, and the knowledge of the final twist enriches the experience instead of diminishing it. Robert Richardson's photography emulates the grimy thrillers most associated with Roger Corman, but done with the budget and precision of a modern blockbuster. The oversaturated colors and the pools of light in each scene give the whole movie a dreamlike effect, and the use of the surrealistic imagery makes this film endlessly compelling just on a visual level. Schoonmaker is reliably brilliant, especially in the last half hour. DiCaprio makes a confused face better than most movie stars, and that face is on full display throughout this film. The real standout is Ruffalo, whose subtle and relaxed performance plays perfectly off of DiCaprio's tightly wound U.S. Marshal. 
Other small appearances from people like Ben Kingsley or Elias Koteas, Max von Sydow, and Michelle Williams ran out the film with perfectly dialed in performances. Number five, Taxi Driver. There's nothing I can say about Taxi Driver that hasn't been said before. It's one of the most influential movies ever made, and it essentially popularized an entire genre of independent film. Paul Schrader's screenplay feels timed perfectly right for the anxieties of the 70s, as Vietnam was coming to a close and the failure of Nixon gave rise to paranoia about the US president. Travis Bickle is a fantastic portrayal of social isolation and political confusion, and the character would still feel right at home today as a token of male rage. Travis Bickle's desire to be important and loved is misplaced, and his relationship with Jodie Foster's Iris allows him to feel like he has a higher calling in protecting her. It's a film people from all walks of life can watch and take something away from, as part of us can relate to Travis Bickle, but we also cower in fear at the very prospect of him. Scorsese's craft truly shines for the first time in his career with this film. The cinematography from Michael Chapman is a perfect blend of subjectivity and objectivity. The camera pans away from Travis, it rises up into ceilings, and seems to frequently have a mind of its own. The editing uses techniques from the French New Wave and pulpy B pictures of the 60s to create a style pretty unique to Scorsese during this time in his career. Bernard Herrmann's iconic score gives the film a timeless quality that could set it really any time in the 20th century. The film is just a classic example of every creative department working together to make a special film. De Niro is just never better than he is right here. Jodie Foster is heartbreaking but never sentimental, Keitel is appropriately creepy yet lovable, and Sybil Shepard basically steals the movie for a few sequences. However, I want to give a special shout out to Peter Boyle, who delivers a fantastic monologue in the middle of this movie. Number four, The Irishman. I've seen The Irishman four times. The first time I saw it, I liked it. The second time I saw it, I liked it more. Then I waited a couple of years. The third time I saw it, I lost my mind. This movie is brilliant and it has every right to be heralded as one of the best movies in all of American cinema. Scorsese, who helped popularize the American Mafia movie himself, expertly deconstructs the tropes he helped establish for three and a half hours, providing the audience with the most complete picture we could ever hope to get of two men who lost themselves in their own ambitions. The Irishman is a perfect blend of performance, story, and craft with each piece working in complete harmony with the other. From the opening and closing framing device to the subtle changes in the film language throughout its runtime, The Irishman is just as much about the last hundred years of American history and politics as it is about organized crime, implicating the country itself as being an integral part of the crimes on display. It's incredible that a movie of this ambition and ethical complexity ever got made at all let alone that it turned out to be one of the crowning achievements of one of the greatest directors to ever do it. Perhaps the most controversial aspect of The Irishman is its use of computer effects and de-aging technology. It does not always convince, and sometimes it's really distracting from the overall experience, but Rodrigo Prieto's photography changes and evolves with the decades of the story. Thelma Schoonmaker's masterful editing keeps up with multiple timelines and narratives and perspectives, and the complete control of direction from Scorsese makes this film a true highlight in the history of American cinema. De Niro plays against type for this movie. Instead of the confident company man from Goodfellas or the inscrutable boss of Casino, De Niro here plays an insecure and quiet man who understands his place as part of the job. His moments in the final minutes of the film rank among the best work he's ever done in his career. Joe Pesci, coming out of retirement to play Russell Buffalino, is quiet, subtle, and brilliant in a role far removed from his earlier work as Tommy. Al Pacino, working with Scorsese for the first time, plays Jimmy Hoffa with all the blustered arrogance you would expect. 
The film is full of fantastic character work from Bobby Cannavale, Ray Romano, Harvey Keitel, and many more. Number three, Gangs of New York. Gangs of New York is sometimes my favorite Martin Scorsese movie. Depending on the day, any one of these top three could take the final spot. While it received mixed reviews upon its initial release, Gangs of New York has rightly garnered more and more love as the years have passed. It is an extremely dense film about politics and masculinity and anger. It's about what it means to be from somewhere, to be part of something in a meaningful way, and the links we will go to to enact revenge on those who have hurt us. Perhaps it's just coincidence that this film was released so soon after the events of 9-11, but the plot is a really interesting parallel to the real-world events of the time in American politics. DiCaprio's Amsterdam is a hollow man in pursuit of vengeance, but we watch as he is consumed by the intoxicating, masculine allure of Daniel Day-Lewis's Bill the Butcher. It's an epic movie told on a large scale using brilliantly constructed sets, and it's one of the defining movies of Scorsese's career, a true example of a movie only Scorsese could have made at this time. From the impeccable set design of Dante Ferretti returning to work with Scorsese from the Age of Innocence, to the costume work by Sandy Powell, everything about the crafts of this movie is perfect. Gangs in New York takes place in an historical period rarely covered in film, so the movie has an almost post-apocalyptic, far-future aesthetic as opposed to one from the past. The cinematography from Michael Bauhaus is appropriately brilliant, and the screenplay from Kenneth Lonergan ripples with excellent character beats throughout. The sound design from Tom Fleischman and his team is densely layered with Irish ballads, and the action scenes crackle with life. Thelma Schoonmaker makes the complicated and densely woven narratives and spaces make sense and, of course, Scorsese's direction is maybe never better than it is here. Really, the only issues I have with this movie at all are in some of the performances, particularly Cameron Diaz, whose accent work is just not very good or consistent, and, unfortunately, Leonardo DiCaprio, who doesn't really seem to be ready to portray this character in this way. Daniel Day-Lewis is obviously mesmerizing as Bill the Butcher, but it also sometimes feels like he is acting in a completely separate movie than the rest of the actors. Number two, The Last Temptation of Christ. Martin Scorsese's career was nearly destroyed by his decade-long quest to direct this film. He was picketed by angry Catholics and was at the center of a national firestorm for directing this film about the final days of Jesus Christ's life. Based on the novel of the same name by Nikos Kazantzakis, The Last Temptation of Christ depicts a much more human and fallible Christ than the one usually portrayed in movies. Played here by Willem Dafoe, the Christ of this film is unsure of his place in the universe, and he struggles to accept the sacrifices he knows he will have to make for humanity. Harvey Keitel, Barbara Hershey, and Harry Dean Stanton round out the cast with excellent turns especially Keitel's portrayal of Judas Iscariot as a street hustler and David Bowie as Pontius Pilate, a frankly demented piece of casting. The film is a beautiful and tragic telling of the passion story, and it's genuinely tragic that the film caused so much controversy and remains largely unseen by so many based on that controversy. It's a moving and delicate film that portrays the sacrifices of Christ as respectfully as I've ever seen in any movie. The score by Peter Gabriel sets the somber and timeless tone of this film, and the soundtrack itself has gone on to have a life outside of its association with this film. Thelma Schoonmaker's editing provides most of the tension here, as we see the world through the perspective of Christ, with flashbacks and flash-forwards tormenting Christ in his last moments. Schoonmaker is able to cut images together in montage in a way that makes it entirely clear to the audience what is at stake. Michael Ballhaus continues his brilliant run of Scorsese films by shooting the film in close-ups and wides, with little in between. Willem Dafoe gives career best work here as Jesus Christ. He is relatable and tragic, 
but you can also understand why people would want to follow him. You can see him carrying the weight of his destiny on his shoulders. Other performances are sometimes less successful, and some of the casting, like David Bowie, feels a bit like stunt casting and actually kind of distracts from the movie. Number one, Goodfellas. There was never another option, okay? As much as I love, love, love The Irishman, part of my enjoyment of that film is my prior experience with this one. This was the first Scorsese film I ever saw, and it remains the most important one to me. Even if I prefer the plot of something like After Hours or Bringing Out the Dead, and, and even if I may have more to say about the complex politics of gangs in New York, Goodfellas is just an undeniable bolt of lightning. This thing leaves ash wherever it goes. It has the montage-like editing of Casino, but the story is one I actually care about. It has the committed performances we've come to expect from Scorsese, but Ray Liotta's portrayal of Henry Hill has every single element of every great performance of a Scorsese protagonist. He has the fragility of Alice, the humor of Jordan Belfort, the wildness of Frank Pierce, the paranoia of Travis Bickle, and the weight of destiny through Jesus Christ. Henry Hill is the quintessential Scorsese character, and his story is one of the warped American dreams, Scorsese's most used theme. Goodfellas is also just a blast to watch. I could watch this thing every week for the rest of my life and still have a good time. What is there to say? The opening moments, the flashbacks, the montages, the soundtrack choices, the evolution of the film language as Henry Hill becomes less stable, the constant narration that somehow works. Everything about Goodfellas works. When Henry Hill starts talking to the camera in a courtroom near the end of the movie, I always jump out of my seat. It's such a small, brilliant choice in a movie full of small, brilliant choices. The amazing long shot of Henry entering the club, the crash zooms, the homages to other films. Everything here is what you would ever want from a film by Martin Scorsese. Leota is obviously fantastic. We get every kind of emotion and performance from him that's possible for a single character. Add in De Niro's scary, more subtle Jimmy and Joe Pesci's maximalist nightmare person, Tommy DeVito, and you've just got a masterpiece. However, special shout out to Lorraine Bracco, who manages to give an emotionally compelling and nuanced performance when on the page she reads like a Tex Avery cartoon. All right, that's it. That's the list. If you have opinions or hot takes or arguments or kind words, maybe, feel free to drop them below in the comments. And what are your favorite Martin Scorsese movies? Why? Let me know. Give me your top fives. Also, which director should I do next? I would love to keep doing these forever.